there are two basic approaches to seeking higher accuracy in our numerical methods. The first of these is to use more of the trajectory history rather than just relying on the last time point propagating from x sub k to x k plus one, we can use what are known as multi-step methods. And a quick sketch of how that works looks like, that is, you take your state at a time step x k plus m times some constant alpha m plus x at k plus m minus one times value alpha m minus one, all the way to x k, so your state now times alpha naught, and you set that equal to your time step delta t times a set of beta constants multiplying the function valuations at the equivalent time steps. So this is literally just taking the exact same thing that we did with the forward Euler, but generalizing it to use an arbitrary number of time points along your trajectory history. The explicit version of this is known as Adams Bashforth. And the first step of an Adams Bashforth method is a forward Euler method. The implicit version of this is called an Adams Moulton, where the first step of an Adams Moulton is just a backward Euler method. MATLAB's ODE113 is what is known as an ABM, Adams Bashforth Moulton, PECE, -E, predictor evaluator, corrector evaluator. What is happening here is that the routine is automatically fitting nth order polynomials to past estimates in order to extrapolate forward in time. And this is a variable order routine using extrapolations between first and 13th order as it goes along. The utility of this is when your function f is expensive to evaluate compared to doing all of this additional propagation work. And so this is well suited for things where the dynamics can be onerous to evaluate, which describes some n-body systems. So this is our first option in seeking higher accuracy of our numerical methods. You go to a multi-step method, and you are forced to add a lot of machinery in terms of handling these extrapolations and error correction schemes. Alternative to multi-step methods is to instead use additional points in the interval t naught to t naught plus delta t for t naught being the starting condition of each propagation step. And these family of methods are known as the runge kutta integration methods. The runge kutta integration scheme looks very much like a generalization of the Euler methods and is written as follows. x of k plus one is equal to x sub k plus your time step delta t times the summation of the functions g sub i times constants b sub i, where you are taking s terms in the summation. The g sub i functions are evaluations of your dynamics of your function f at x of k and t sub k, that's the first one, and then x of k plus delta t times some constant a21 times this first g1 at time tk plus some constant c2 times delta t, and so on and so forth. And so as you're going along, in general, each next g sub i function is adding the previous function step to the x sub k and is adding a new constant times delta t to the time step. So in order to define a runge kutta scheme, you need to define a vector of these c values, a vector of these b values, and a matrix of these a values. And typically, we do so in something called a butcher tableau, which puts the c's in this first column, puts all the a's next to it, and then puts the transpose of the b's in the final row. Here, the butcher tableau is shown as lower triangular, implicitly making all of the upper triangular terms zero. If that is the case, if a is lower triangular, then the runge kutta method defined via that a is going to be explicit because none of these evaluations require looking forward to subsequent g functions. They only rely on previously evaluated g functions. However, a does not need to be lower triangular. A can be completely filled. And if there are non-zero values above the diagonal, then the runge kutta method will be implicit 
And once again, you will very likely be forced to do numerical iteration within each time step in order to define these functions. A runga kata method is consistent, and recall that consistency is the condition where the limit of the local truncation error divided by the time step goes to zero as the time step goes to zero. In the case where the sum from j equals one to however many of the a's you have of a sub i j is equal to c sub i for i being two to s. A very common modification to runga kata methods is something called adaptive runga kata. In this case, we estimate the local truncation error by using two different runga kata methods. And we define a butcher tableau that looks like, that is for a single matrix A and a single vector C, we define two different B vectors, B and B star. B is going to be of order P and B star is going to define a method of order P minus one. We then estimate the local truncation error as the difference between the propagation xk plus one based on the order p b method minus the propagation xk plus one, which we'll call x star at k plus one, evaluated using the b star values, so the order p minus one method. And that works out to the time step delta t times the summation from i equals one to s of b sub i minus b star sub i times that function g sub i that we've previously defined. This is why you will very frequently see runga kata schemes implemented with two different orders. And this is MATLAB's ODE 45. So this is using a fourth and fifth order method or ODE 23, for example, using a second and third order method. And this is done explicitly so that there is a cheap and convenient way of doing that local truncation error estimation. The adaptive part comes in, in that most of these methods, if the local truncation error is estimated to go beyond some user-defined bound, will back up and will change the time step, will decrease the time step such that they meet the required local truncation error tolerances as defined by the user. And whether you know it or not, these things are happening behind the scenes when you use things like ODE 45 and ODE 23. And this is what we are controlling when we set things like relative and absolute error tolerances in those integration schemes. These methods and many others like them, they are explicitly good for non-stiff expressions. And what they get you is a delta T sub K that is proportional to your local truncation error meaning that as you go along, you have near constant truncation error. This makes these methods really good as general purpose tools. If you know nothing about the physics being encoded by your integrator function f, then these are a really good go-to, which is why these are typically the first thing that you turn to when you are trying to numerically integrate some new set of dynamics. However, as we will see, they are actually fairly poorly suited to Hamiltonian systems, to explicitly n-body systems, because this is the only thing that they care about, maintaining this constant local truncation error. And that is not the most important thing to be conserving when it comes to the physics of Hamiltonian systems. However, before we get there, there's a few more numerical techniques that we should consider. The next one is known as Richardson extrapolation, and more generally, sequence acceleration. The idea here is, if a sequence converges with more points, then you can extrapolate to infinitely many points from solutions with increasing number of points. So as an example, let's say x, your state, evaluated delta t, is an approximation of the true solution phi, where delta t is greater than 0. And we have an error definition as follows. e is equal to a summation of some constant a naught times delta t to the m naught plus a1 times delta t to the m1 plus a2 times delta t to the m2 and so on and so forth. And we arrange these such that delta t to the m sub i is going to be greater than delta t to the m i plus one for all i. So these are steadily ticking down in magnitude. The a sub i's are some unknown constants 
and the m sub i's are considered to be known values such that we can arrange it in this fashion. Therefore, the error, which is the difference between the true solution phi and our approximation x evaluated delta t, gives us the expression phi, the true solution, is equal to x of delta t plus a naught times delta t to the m naught plus all these other terms, which will be of order delta t to the m1 or smaller because we've made this assumption. We're going to substitute delta t over h for delta t for some value h, and we're going to multiply this entire thing by h to the m naught minus one. And when the smoke clears, we will have an expression that looks as follows. Phi is going to look like h to the m naught times x evaluated at delta t over h minus x divided at delta t, all divided by h to the m naught minus one, plus terms of order delta t to the m1. So we can repeat this process over and over again, removing higher and higher orders of error, and get a general recursive equation of the form xk plus 1 evaluated delta t equals h to the mk, xk evaluated at delta t over h, minus xk evaluated delta t over h to the mk minus 1, where x naught, starting this whole process, is just x of delta t whatever our first approximation to this was. So this all feels very abstract. I personally find it helpful to draw a visualization of what this is doing for us. So we're thinking here specifically about the propagation between some time t naught and t naught plus delta t. If we take that h value to be equal to two, we are just taking a single step between these. So we evaluate a single midpoint step, and we end up here in our propagation. And then we repeat this process for h equal to 4, for example, splitting the range twice. And we might get something that looks like. And the reason why we expect this to look different from this is because we are taking different interior steps. And so our function evaluation will lead to different results based on the different substeps that were taken. We do this again and again. Adding an h equals 8, h equals 16, and on and on and on. And what we are very likely to find for well-behaved functions is if we look at the final points, we will get some kind of a trend where our propagation is continuously trending in some direction. And this is what we fit to. And this is what we extrapolate based on. And this is the process known as sequence acceleration. And you'll notice I circled only the H4816 points here. It's very common to drop the initial course propagation uh, depending on how the method is implemented. So you can effectively span very, very large intervals by doing this process, meaning that you can take larger and larger steps in time and take larger and larger delta T values. But obviously, this is an expensive process. And so the payoff here, this is worthwhile when the function evaluations f of x, t, are themselves numerically expensive. So based on this concept, we establish what is known as a burlish stower method. The basic idea here is that we are fitting multiple flows with different delta t's and extrapolating to delta t equal to 0 with what is known as rational function extrapolation. The basic scheme of burlish stower is a modified midpoint method. You are going to advance by a time step delta t equal to h of n, with your first iterand x0 being set to your current condition x of t, and then x1 being set to x0 plus h, this h times the function evaluation of x0 t, and on and on, such that in general, the jth iterand step is equal to x at j minus 2, plus 2hf xj minus 1 t plus j minus 1 h for some j that is greater than 1. The final approximation of x at t plus delta t will be equal to 1 half of x sub n plus x n minus 1 plus h times f evaluated at x sub n and t plus delta t. The error for this method, the local truncation error, 
is given by x of t plus delta t minus phi of t plus delta t, which will equal the summation of a sub i times h to the 2i. And you will notice that this only contains even powers of h. We recalculate x at t plus delta t using n over 2k steps, and we can combine these in a weighted average to get very, very high accuracy. bowler stower generalizes the averaging of the polynomial or rational function extrapolation of x evaluated at t plus hn. hn is constant and n increases. And we use this process of Richardson extrapolation to get an estimate of x evaluated as n goes to effectively infinity. You can therefore once again use this specific method to advance ODEs over very, very large time steps with fairly high accuracy as compared to, for example, Runge-Kutta methods, which tend to suffer greatly when you take delta t to be large. So we've now established our basic tool set of numerical integration techniques. There are obviously many, many others, but we're going to turn now to looking specifically at numerical integration of Hamiltonian systems.